It is no exaggeration to say, I think, that one of the great historic successes of modern government has been the creation of great public universities. And nowhere has this been more important than in the United States. Over the 150 years since the federal government's Morrill Act provided land grants and thus a steady stream of income to public universities and income free from political interference, US public universities, at least until recently, have flourished. And even today, and even this morning, they still occupy 11 of the 26 US universities uh, uh, that, uh, there are still 11 of the 26 universities in the top 50 spots uh, in the THE rankings. Now I mention this not to uh, bring up the case, uh, the, the issue of American exceptionalism or dominance, but rather I want to convey uh, here this afternoon how much I believe is at stake if you might share the belief that the excellence of my country's great public universities has played a crucial role in fostering not just the research capabilities of the contemporary university, but also economic growth, innovation, civic engagement, socioeconomic, socioeconomic mobility, a vibrant, if not always functional, democracy, uh, and an engaged and sometimes even enlightened civil society. If that is the case, and this is my argument here today, then the fate of public universities in the United States, and by implication, the project of sustaining and or creating what these universities represent, among other things, and I'll sort of cut to the chase, broad access to excellence uh, on a large scale, is of paramount importance, not just for the educational ecosystem in the United States, but I think for the global ecosystem as well. So what I'd like to do today is engage three distinct questions that go right to the heart of all that ties the quality of our global future to the fate of universities like my own. How did great public universities come into being? Why are they valuable? And what might we need to do to sustain them as part of the global ecosystem of world-class universities in the 21st century and beyond? Now, of course, the ecosystem is somewhat distinct in the US with its unique mix of private and public universities. But if that mix changes in dramatic ways, it may have enormous and potentially damaging implications, not just for us, but I think globally as well, at least in the broader sense that I'll be talking about uh, today. Now, in the United States, historically, the goal of government in establishing public universities was to broaden access to higher education as well as to direct the educational and research mission of these universities towards more practical and applied arts, uh, or to the mechanical as well as the metaphysical arts, as it was put in the language that was used to proclaim the creation of the University of California in 1868. When Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Act into law in 1862, he did so to create universities for and of the people. He did so, however, not with the goal of creating a second tier of university for a second tier of the population. As colleges and universities morphed, in, morphed from their origins as religious institutions to become secular, they also increasingly took on a research mission of the kind that had achieved its highest expression in 19th century Germany. Along with the origins of the American Research University at places such as Johns Hopkins and the University of Chicago, and with the eventual, eventual transformation of colonial colleges like Harvard and Columbia into research universities, came the critical role of public universities in the development of high-level research, conjoined significantly, and I think uh, inextricably, with a mission to educate the broad public. Thus it was that Michigan and Wisconsin, Illinois, and then California, among many others, became known as flagship public universities, that is to say, as universities that were both great engines of research and graduate training, as well as desirable and accessible undergraduate destinations for the growing middle class. Now what distinguishes today's great public universities from the great private ones, however, is neither the source of their funding nor the nature of their research missions. Today, the great public universities in the US receive only a small fraction of their income directly from the state. My own university, Berkeley, currently receives only 13% of its general revenues from the state. Michigan, only 
the University of Virginia is down to 6%. While the reasons for this precipitous decline in state funding goes well beyond what I want to talk about this morning, my point is to recognize the reality that state funding is no longer what defines the public quality of these universities. Likewise, it is not the substance of the research foci of the different universities that distinguishes the great publics from the great privates. One would be hard pressed to see a substantively different commitment to the types of research being done at the top public medical school, namely our sister school, University of California in San Francisco, from that being done at the top private medical schools, whether Harvard, Johns Hopkins, or Stanford. Across different fields, from crystallography to the history of South Asia, which is my field, the same types of questions rooted in the same sorts of ethical and public commitments are being pursued by scholars in private and public universities alike. The quality of research may of course vary, but that public universities have been critical for the establishment of the highest levels of research and graduate training is still reflected in the prominent role played by flagship public universities. Public universities tend to have closer connections to local and state governments, and they often participate in policy think tanks more readily than private universities. And there is no doubt that at my university, UC Berkeley, there is a pervasive public spiritedness in much of the research that is done from work in engineering to work in the arts. By the same token, Berkeley takes great pride in the public spiritedness of our students who go into public service in far greater numbers than most of our private counterparts and of our faculty who are known for their deep engagement with contemporary societal issues and commitment to advancing the greater good. There is, however, another and here is my point, distinguishing element that the great American public universities like Berkeley share, a feature of our campus communities and societal commitments that goes right to the heart of why the public good is so tied to the future of public universities. In terms of lasting, measurable, and concrete contributions to the greater good, however, what truly and consistently distinguishes the great publics from the great privates has to do with the makeup of the student body and more specifically with the commitment and ability of public universities to provide an excellent education to the broadest possible swath of the public. As one way to make this point, consider the enrollment of Pell Grant students. In the United, United States, this is a federal program uh, that targets low income students from low-income families who generally make less than $50,000 a year and thus qualify for federal grants. Uh, now, at uh, at UC Berkeley, if you take UC Berkeley and UCLA, the top, usually the top two public, uh, public research universities in the US, uh, and you uh, look at the number of Pell Grants, it turns out together we have slightly over 20,000 Pell Grant students currently enrolled. This is as many, just to give some sense of scale, as many as the top 16 US private universities combined. UCLA alone has more Pell Grant students than the entire Ivy League, and we're close. Berkeley's Pell Grant students are greater in number than Harvard's entire undergraduate population. In terms of maintaining access, in other words, these two great public universities arguably do more to make meritocracy and social mobility a reality than does the entire collective of Caltech, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Princeton, Yale, Chicago, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Penn, Duke, Cornell, Northwestern, Carnegie Mellon, NYU, and Washington University. Again, I'm talking about scale, but scale at that level matters. Now, this is precisely why the recently released Other Times quantitative assessment, this of US universities, it did a measurement of the 200 top American public and private colleges and universities in terms of ac accessibility and affordability. Oops. There it is. Uh, why it was so remarkable uh, and had in the top seven six campuses from the University of California. Berkeley being the most selective of the University of California, it was at the bottom, but it was still in the top ten. And we're one of the only universities that gets that kind of ranking routinely in the US while also be, being put in the top ten in terms of research. So the significance of the great public universities is not just that they provide access, and more importantly, that they provide access to affordable education at a very large scale. 
In fact, the top 20 public universities in the US enroll about three times as many students as the 20 most prestigious private institutions. Uh, now, it has long been a truism at Berkeley that you can combine academic excellence at the highest level with the public mandate to offer access to large numbers of deserving students regardless of their economic or social backgrounds. And from the point of view of my university, and for that matter from the standpoint of the University of California system as a whole, the meaning of public has never involved any diminution of excellence or quantity, either in education or in research. Uh, indeed, far from meaning mediocrity for all, it has meant access to the public's best for the best of the public. Now, in this respect, the access mission and the research mission are inseparable. The importance of research, whether directed towards new medical cures and treatments, new understandings of the universe or of materials, advances in understanding climate change, alternative energy possibilities, or for that matter, scholarly investigations into and attention to the meanings of literary and cultural works, historical questions, what have you, is arguably rooted right, uh, 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 is rooted directly in the idea of the public good, as they are powerful demonstrations of the larger significance of the research university as an institution. But there's an additional reason that justifies the public importance of public research universities, for it is through exposure to top research and to researchers at every level, from the beginning years of an undergraduate uh, career on up, that students gain many of the critical skills that allow them not just to operate at the highest levels of society, but to obtain their greatest potential as human beings. And we've heard actually some examples of this this morning. The underlying principle here then is that the greater the access and the more diverse the population afforded ex access to excellence, the better, not just for the individual students whose material, civic, intellectual, and scientific lives will be greatly enhanced, but for society as a whole. This then gets uh, to the heart, I think, of what great public universities provide, access to excellence at scale. The point here is that my university in particular, and most flagship public universities in general, should be valued not just for their academic excellence, but because they provide exponentially more access to the kind of excellence that without them would be confined to a small number of pr private colleges and universities with dire consequences for the fundamental ideas that gave rise to public universities in the past and equally dire implications for efforts to confront li rising levels of inequality in the future. So if the public good is manifest uh, in this sense and that understanding is shared, a major difficulty, certainly a difficulty for us uh, in California, is that those in the public who are not afforded access will tend to reject this idea that there is any more good in a public university than in a private. And unfortunately, in the United States, there's been no increase in the number of public universities or available spaces at existing institutions to match the growth of our population at a time, of course, that we're taking increasing numbers of students, not just from out of state to balance our revenues uh, and expenses, but internationally as well. And as selectivity increases, so too does a sense of exclusion, especially in elite public universities. At the same time, while public universities maintain a strong commitment to public service, they neither have a monopoly in this regard, nor do the public uniformly value the significance of these services as they have li little in the way of lobbies or publicists to popularize their or our mission. So what does this mean? Perhaps the best way to come to grips uh, with the question is to pose what no longer seems to be an impossible prospect for the future. Imagine a world in which public universities have been degraded to uniform mediocrity and all the best universities, at least in the US, are private. What would be lost? What would be the personal losses, but more significantly, what would be the social and collective losses? Surely the logic of meritocracy demands a certain minimum level of access to our best colleges and universities, and the question for us now may be what that minimum level should be, and what our uh, government, but also what our, what our society and even our private sector uh, should, uh, should provide as a matter of principle. Unfortunately, this is not a rhetorical question, certainly not in the US and apparently not in Australia either. 
As state funding to public universities has dropped precipitately, it has become an open and live question as to whether great public universities like Berkeley, even including Berkeley, can maintain both our distinction and our genuine access, by which we mean, in particular, our inclusiveness of students from across the socioeconomic spectrum. For the moment, our success on both registers, thankfully, is as high as I'm arguing here, uh, the issues uh, that are at stake in this, uh, in this consideration. But uh, will this continue? Now, if excellence is part two of what defines the great public university, not access alone, then there's no denying that this great social benefit is an expensive one to deliver, and one that despite our best efforts to, gets more expensive all the time. Uh, as a, as a result, of course, of the well-known cost disease of higher education. But with that uh, public funding, with, with public funding disappearing, many great public universities increasingly feel as if they are faced with a dire existential choice of abandoning either their commitment to access or their commitment to excellence. And the two begin to get pulled apart. I, of course, uh, am a believer that we can avoid this existential choice though to do so will mean moving well beyond the question of bending the cost curve, which is what we hear about repeatedly, uh, not only in the popular press, but from uh, even those politicians in the US vying for national office who are our friends and in support of higher education and questions of access. Although we doubtless need to continue bending uh, the cost curve to the extent that we can, we must not bend it until it breaks. I believe instead that it is crucial for us to develop radically new funding mechanisms that will entail new and innovative partnerships between public universities and the private sector. In short, at a time of state disinvestment, as much as I would like to believe the government will step up and do much, much more, I believe the private sector needs to step up as well to support our mission in a manner that is commensurate with the benefits it enjoys as a result, not only of the highly educated uh, workforce and indeed not only uh, for the research we provide, but also for the social contract that public universities have always represented. Already, the glimmerings of this new model can be seen in the many innovative partnerships that are emerging between public universities and private sector corporations. Consider one example from, uh, from Berkeley, our Energy Biosciences Institute, in which researchers from Berkeley and British Petroleum have been working side by side with BP funding on basic research uh, into next generation biofuels designed to address the world's desperate need for carbon-free energy resources. Consider the many ways in which corporations like Google, Siemens, or Novartis have also partnered to translate research into commercial products and shared in the resulting revenues. And consider the dozens of scholarships, certainly at my university, uh, as well as endowed chairs, that corporations increasingly are stepping up to sponsor. But now if our great public universities are to sustain their mission to serve the public interest, we must think in new ways about partnerships that span not only sectors of our society, but also the national borders within which we think about even the universities grouped together in the ranking released this morning. Increasingly, the most important challenges we face are global ones, whether in the domain of climate change, growing inequality, forced migration, cultural misunderstanding and strife, cybersecurity, health, to mention only a few. If we are to fully take these complex global challenges on as our collective responsibility, as I believe we must both in our research and in our education, we must also commit to building new kinds of global partnerships among institutions with the means and the motivation to build the future capacity and global impact of universities in all parts of the globe, private and public. As I wrote about last fall in the uh, THE ranking supplement, we at Berkeley have thus, uh, have, have, have thus crafted, in this regard, a plan for a global campus on property we own just 10 miles north of our own campus, in a beautiful location on the San Francisco Bay that connects not only to UC's great medical school across the bay, but also to the Silicon Valley, the acknowledged center of technological and entrepreneurial innovation. The Berkeley Global Campus will create new levels of multilateral partnership, not only among universities, but with industry and with the corporate world. Here too, we seek the beneficial participation of a private sector guided not only by the pursuit of profit, uh, 
but also by enlightened self-interest and social responsibility too. As we embark on this new venture, we will also provide new opportunities for our extraordinarily diverse student body to become not just citizens of California, the original charter of the land-grant university, but of the world. We take this challenge quite literally, as we've decided to place at the core of the global campus a college of advanced study that will take on issues related to global governance, global ethics, global citizenship, and global relationships more broadly. And the goal here is twofold. The first, that universities represent the most successful experiments in global institution building. The second, that if universities work together to build global curricula and global platforms for research and for teaching, they might provide models and ideas that will predicate new ways of engaging and reimagining not just globalization, but our global future. Now, this mutualist vision of the globalized university is rooted in a fundamental assessment of the inexorable direction of the global future, which is increasingly knitted together not just around a single global research enterprise, but also of the changing social and economic role of a preeminent research university like ours uh, in a time where things are changing radically in terms of support and in terms of the kinds of challenges we confront. In contrast to what might be called the high modernist vision of the state university as a machine, going back to 1960 and the master plan, as a machine whose output would be knowledge workers contributing to the state economy, the Berkeley Global Campus represents the first class research university as a focal point for enabling the state and its citizens to engage the world. Connecting, in this instance, Berkeley scholars and local industry with researchers and innovators worldwide and drawing human and financial capital from across the globe into the state and then out uh, back again. Rather than the cloistered space envisioned by the traditional inward looking campus, uh, this new campus will be a site for the flow of ideas, information, money, technology, and people, most importantly people, moving not only between Berkeley and foreign universities, but also between private and public sectors, and indeed uh, doing so with increasing velocity all the time. By acknowledging the irreversible force of global trends, the extent to which no local challenge is disconnected from global issues, and the powerful role that our universities, both in the United States and represented by you all here from around the world, we seek to establish a new kind of global presence that is fully in concert with that old public mission established back in the 1860s. And indeed, uh, this is part of a new logic of collaboration that is not meant to replace the competition that is at the core, in some sense, of the rankings, but which nevertheless has to, I think, complement at every point the way we're thinking about the kinds of ways we engage the challenges of working uh, together on issues that we all share in much more than we differ. So, uh, so as, as such, uh, we believe our continued excellence will be reflected in the continued recognition of and importance attached to our particular brand, to be sure. Uh, and these networks, uh, we hope, will help leverage and expand them. But as the process unfolds, we hope also that the global campus will constitute in part a fundamental reimagining of the role not just of our university, not just of the American State University or the flagship university, but of all of our universities together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. We do have some question, time for questions before the lunch break. Looking for some hands. I, could I ask you, um, in, in practical terms, how would a, a, a university actually get involved in the global campus? What are you looking for in terms of partnerships? Is it a, a sort of standard outpost for, for a multitude of different institutions in, in California with you? Or what are you looking for in terms of the partnerships? Well, we're talking to a number of different universities, but I think the, the, the real key here, I'm not here really uh, uh, trying to advertise what we're doing so much as to suggest it as a model a kind of way of thinking, uh, which we're not engaged in alone, a lot of other universities are doing this too, a way of thinking about global networks. Uh, and uh, and in, in, a, in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing a little bit at the global rankings just to say that uh, as we think about uh, the inevitably competitive uh, 
uh, juices that get uh, that get set in motion when you start looking at uh, at a uh, a list that goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. <laughs> in my case, uh, uh, one might also think of the, about the extent to which uh, you know the encompassment of of so many uh, uh, fabulous global universities might be done in part by thinking about new kinds of global networks, new kinds of partnerships, of which this will be one, and doubtless only one, of many other examples. So on the one hand, you know, we're looking for places that have pre-existing research collaborations with our scholars. I mean, that's where a lot of the energy of, of this uh, began and where it continues to be sustained. Uh, I think uh, I, I've tried to point to the importance of research. I mean, in the United States, there's a great debate, as there is, I'm sure, everywhere else about how much emphasis to put on research and how much to put on teaching, uh, whether or not that great uh, utopian idea of keeping them together uh, should now be finally surrendered in the face of the kinds of demands simply to process students and get them uh, graduated with some hope of uh, uh, providing the, the, the people necessary for a workforce in the future. Uh, and, uh, and here I'm suggesting both, of course, that I continue to believe in that old, in that old project, but that furthermore, uh, it is uh, even more uh, important in a global context with respect to the kinds of ways in which we can find connections and forge new partnerships over time. And why have you chosen a model which seems quite counterintuitive that it's a global campus 10 miles away from your domestic campus? Why not the branch campus? Why not set up in China or Singapore or out, out here in, in the Asia-Pacific region? What, what's wrong with that model as far as you're concerned? Right, well, you know, I, I, before coming to Berkeley, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in New York. At, I was at Columbia. And we watched uh, NYU do some extraordinary things. And uh, I've been uh, uh, steadily impressed by the kind of uh, uh, brio that John Sexton showed by going off to set up branch campuses in, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. Uh, and like uh, leaders of most other universities, uh, we get approached all the time, both at Columbia and at Berkeley to, to do this. Uh, there are a number of things that uh, went into our thinking about this. The first one was that uh, it is sometimes very difficult to uh, argue to a local constituency, and I think this is especially true for a public university, that a branch campus will really have enormous uh, feedback benefit to the home campus. So uh, this is meant precisely to allay that concern. But it's also, uh, uh, and I'll say two things and then I'll uh, stop, but it, it's also meant to be more than that. On the one hand, uh, as I mentioned before, it really is part of a network. Uh, so it won't be a freestanding uh, uh, center. It'll ultimately be uh, one of many centers that uh, will be global in their, uh, in their reach. But secondly, uh, there are uh, all sorts of reasons why uh, it makes a lot of sense to have a specifically dedicated global campus very close to home, both because home happens to be uh, in the Northern California ecosystem, and because it happens to provide certain kinds of uh, guarantees that are simply not afforded uh, by setting up branch campuses in the places that typically uh, branch campuses have been set up in. Academic freedom, uh, freedom from political interference, uh, uh, access to uh, uh, not just support for research, but, uh, but for opportunities in educational, in developing educational programs uh, in which hopefully uh, there will be a genuinely uh, free and open political uh, uh, space and, uh, and space for exchange that, uh, that again would be much more difficult in a branch campus. Thanks, I've seen a few hands, if we could get the mic. There's a nice cluster of four all sitting next to each other. If we could pass the mic around, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Arun Sharma uh, from QUT. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think one of the great things about America is not just the Ivy League and the private universities, the great public universities that have, uh, that have shown excellence. Uh, we have been watching the, the crisis of public funding for these universities. In Australia, we have similar issues, perhaps not to the same extent. But you have more abilities to experiment in America. We have exactly one system, one government that we have to deal with. Different states perhaps are trying different things. And I want you to reflect on what are some of the experiments that are happening. You know, we are aware of one of your former Columbia executives, Michael Crow at Arizona State. Uh, he, it's probably not at the same excellence level as Berkeley, but still quite good quality. And scaling access 
to an order of magnitude higher than most sort of private universities can, can achieve. What are some of the other experiments and what do you see the future uh, for, for this crisis that, that, that you are facing? Well, just to recapitu recapitulate, and indeed, uh, uh, I think it's widely known that uh, you know most, and you mentioned this in, in contextualizing the release of the rankings this morning, the, the cuts in state funding, the kind of pressures that are being put on, uh, on American public universities in particular, not to mention flat federal budgets for the most part for the support of scientific research. And, uh, and, and, and yet, uh, and again, moving from a private to a public university, I see this quite acutely. Uh, the challenges for public universities are, are huge. And, and while there's, uh, there's room for, uh, uh, for differences among and between uh, the states, uh, there's an alarming uh, repetition uh, and, uh, and recurrence of the same phenomena that, are that, that is taking place from state to state. Uh, whether you're in Wisconsin, uh, Colorado, uh, North Carolina uh, or California, uh, and uh, and indeed even uh, in California, which uh, has such a great system, really an extraordinary array of, of very fine research institutions, still uh, supported by the state, uh, you you also see uh, just a steady decline in funding and a uh, and yet uh, a, a, a disinterest on the part of the state to uh, to to devolve regulatory control and authority to the universities themselves. And I think that's probably similar in other parts of the world. In a way, we say the less we get state funded, the more we are state regulated. And that's um, uh, a, a, a very hot political uh, concern right now. And I think that's true uh, across many different states. You mentioned Michael Crow and Arizona State University. He's doing, uh, indeed, extraordinarily innovative things. <laughs> Uh, he says, and I think he's right, uh, that uh, going to a second tier research university, he's not a member of the American Association of Universities, for example, but uh, going there has given him more flexibility. Uh, he's able to, uh, to operate with a different kind of uh, departmental and disciplinary structure. Uh, it's also the largest, uh, in terms of student body, public university in the United States. Uh, so he has huge challenges. He has students who are as good as students anywhere in the country, but he has a lot of students who uh, just get in with B minus averages from, uh, from, from public schools. And he's committed to almost a kind of open access at that level. So, uh, so in that sense, he almost is obliged uh, to combine uh, online and, uh, and residential learning uh, techniques, uh, even on the campus itself, to, uh, to accommodate such a, such a large uh, uh, population. And I think, uh, Brian, he's taken over the uh, the top party school uh, ranking from uh, the neighbor uh, uh, across the state, but um, but the uh, but it is a fascinating experiment to watch, uh, and I think uh, in his most recent book, uh, uh, Michael's really put it out there in some sense uh, to uh, to be and serve as a kind of laboratory uh, for thinking through different things, some of which will work and some of which will. Uh, will probably fail spectacularly, uh, but I applaud him for his willingness both to do new things and potentially to fail. Thanks. Uh, Brian, we have a question. Yeah, Brian McGrath, uh, Dublin City University, Ireland. Nicholas, thank you for a, for a great speech. Um, you said in it that the, the private sector needs to step up to support universities at a time of state disinvestment. Now, the examples you gave were mainly research-based, so, so I have two questions. One is, how do you incentivize the private sector to support other areas of university activity, particularly, for example, undergraduate education? And secondly, do you see any dangers in terms of loss of independence in, in accepting such funding? Right. Well, the first uh, uh, question is a really uh, terrific one because we are indeed trying to think of ways to engage the private sector, uh, or at least certain principal actors in the private sector, to, uh, to think beyond supporting R&D in specific areas in which they have a proprietary interest. Uh, because as much as you can establish, uh, as we did with BP, uh, uh, domains within which this serves our own researchers and uh, who are able to use the funding for their own purposes, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, it doesn't actually then put money back into the larger question of how you serve this broad population of undergraduate students, uh, which is part of our original charter and which is part, I believe, of what uh, we must continue to be able to figure out how to do in the future. Uh, 
Uh, and in that respect, you know, we're, we're, trying, we're actually working with, uh, with, with leaders in, in corporations and industry to think through different kinds of proposals. My, my predecessor, Bob Bergenau, has, always, has already, as part of the Lincoln Project that's being run by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, proposed uh, a, a kind of corporate tax uh, targeting uh, offshore monies. Uh, we're trying to develop a proposal that might involve uh, uh, something like what Salesforce did in uh, the case of California, reserving a certain uh, percentage of corporate earnings that would go into a general kind of endowment that could be more like a stock grant uh, than a land grant, but nevertheless uh, support education, uh, or at least higher education at a certain level uh, that involves research, but also has that primary social commitment uh, across the board, but uh, we're still very, uh, uh, very much in, in, in initial phases of thinking this through. In terms of uh, uh, ensuring uh, the lack of political interference, I mean, of course, one of the great things about the original land grant was that it was money that was given. It wasn't given uh, with all sorts of strings attached, although uh, some states uh, in the United States, anyway, have less constitutional autonomy than others. Uh, notably, uh, California, which had to work for its first 10 years to get that constitutional autonomy. Michigan, which uh, was in many ways the model for California, are great state universities in part because they have that level of uh, insulation uh, from, uh, uh, from, from direct political intervention and, and, and interference. And of course, the same is true of corporate uh, uh, relationships uh, if funding were to go in that direction. Uh, but you know, again, uh, it's not as if we are uh, dealing with a situation where we were completely independent. Uh, we need to be able to talk about academic freedom and we need to be able to talk about the ways in which uh, you know, the peer review system of, uh, of, of academic has worked so well for the, for the system of academic excellence uh, and be able to sell that to, uh, to any number of potential supporters. So we have five minutes, I want to squeeze in three questions. So Ed and your neighbor, if you could, could we have them both at the same time, please? Uh, Caroline Evans from the University of Melbourne. Thank you for a really fascinating speech. I'm, I want to probe a little bit uh, on some of the issues that came out from the last question. You put an emphasis on public good, which I think we would all agree is an important part of almost any university, but certainly of a public university. But as we become squeezed with state funding, we move to industry and linkages with industry, and there are all sorts of good reasons for doing that. Is there a danger over time that that starts to distort the public good message uh, and the public good emphasis to serve more private ends. Uh, and in particular, it may give an incentive to governments over time to start disinvesting in research themselves, saying, well, industry can, should, and has done it, uh, even while governments perhaps might most appropriately be involved in some sorts of blue skies or uh, social, socially beneficial research that industry may not, and there's no particular reason for them to be more interested in. Thank you. Um, you, you may have answered my point largely already, but uh, I just want to take you back to my good friend Michael Crow uh, and to, uh, to summarize the key point of his latest book, The, uh, the New American University, I see it as something like uh, education from high level research intensive universities is an incredibly uh, rare uh, uh, resource. Uh, the world needs a lot more of this than we're currently providing together. Uh, we define ourselves through excellence and exclusion, and the dilemma is to move more comprehensively towards maintaining excellence with a philosophy of inclusion. And I just wondered if you could comment on that last sentence and give your view as to how close we are to achieving that, because I can see from your, your talk today that you largely agree with the, the overall thesis. I'm sorry, can you try those both quickly? I want to squeeze two more questions in as well. But, um, sorry to press you, but I think... Yeah, no, no, I, uh, uh, time is short. Um, uh, for the first question, look, I, 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 I very much uh, take your concerns to heart. Uh, and uh, in, in, in re the public good, uh, it is easier, even if it's never been easy, to, uh, to hold that uh, it's, it's uh, maybe more appropriate for, uh, for a government that has a public system of accountability built into it to support uh, the public good than for corporations. Uh, that being said, uh, again, I'm a historian, I always go back to the past. The first 10 years of the University of California was a nightmare because uh, there were agricultural interests that kept uh, 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 intruding uh, so much so that the president, Daniel Coit Gilman, left in uh, 
uh, desperation and went off to take a job founding Johns Hopkins and the first major research university in the United States. But he left because of political interference and he left because the public good was simply being left out of that process. So it's not as if it hasn't happened before. Uh, but I think uh, what is, uh, is clear to me is, A, there are limits to what we're gonna get by keeping, uh, returning to the, to the argument that it should be the government and public funding. And B, uh, there's a real willingness on the part of corporations to take on, not just for uh, brand reasons, but I think for other ones as well, uh, you know, increasing uh, conversations in the US about the problem of inequality, for example, for the first time happening in the corporate sector, to take on uh, some kind of responsibility for thinking through what the public good might actually be. But again, it's something one has to be very careful about. Uh, and uh, again, I uh, uh, applaud Michael in part because of his, and ASU in part precisely because they can continue to, uh, to really make inclusion uh, a real policy. We talk about inclusion uh, and access uh, at the University of California while we're getting more and more ex selective and therefore more and more exclusive. Uh, where we are inclusive in a way that is so dramatically represented in that New York Times ranking is in terms of socioeconomic diversity. But it still leaves uh, uh, the problems of undermatching, the problems of, uh, of uh, the increasing challenges of young people across the spectrum, but it's particularly in, in, in the lower socioeconomic sectors, uh, huge challenges in terms of actually getting uh, educations in, in selective enough institutions where their education really will matter in terms of their own social mobility over time. And that's another matter which we could talk about separately. But. A very, very quickly question there, and then I would like Professor Sue to have a final say because you have had your hand up for a long time. Really okay. quick. Uh, thank you. Um, Louise Simpson, Director of the World 100 Reputation Network. Uh, very interesting talk, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering whether the rankings should be more responsive to making clear which universities are public as opposed to private if the rankings are influencing student choice, which our research definitely shows uh, students are much more likely to look at the rankings now to determine where they go. And there is a danger that the rankings perhaps are becoming a bit of a rich list of universities. So how could the rankings clarify public versus private? How would public be defined? I'm conscious that Oxford and Cambridge are public universities and how could perhaps corporate social responsibility be measured within the rankings? Thanks, we get the mic over there while <laughs> Nicholas addresses that one. Sorry about this, it's a fantastic that we have so many questions, so much conversation, which will continue over uh, lunch. My, na but, uh, yeah, my name is Yoso, uh, professor at uh, Postech, Poang University of Science Technology in Korea. Yeah. And uh, this is probably a very interesting question that 35 years ago, I, I was a graduate student of Stanford, Stanford University. I, I still remember the uh, huge uh, rivalry between Stanford and Berkeley. Uh, sort of, you know the big games, right? <laughs> and then this is probably an interesting question that uh, how much the, the, uh, that the existence of Stanford influence uh, the Berkeley in terms of improving education and uh, research qualities uh, the reason I'm asking this question is that in Korea, there is a big rival in science engineering between Postec and KAIST. I mean, they, they are ranked the top five in, in the world in terms of uh, young universities ranking. So uh, uh, that we have a big you know, sports games like that. So I have been very curious about the rivalry between and Berkeley and Stanford, how much it has contributed to the improvements of both universities. That's, that's my question. Thanks. Right, okay, so how much time do I have? Well, 30 every seconds. minute is taking these people from their lunch, but I think they'll be really <laughs> pleased to... Standing between you and lunch, they that can uh, certainly will, uh, will, will... Okay, but, 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 but briefly, uh, if you remember uh, the reputational rankings, which I, I like to revert to in the THE, uh, the top six by far are actually interesting to look at for all sorts of reasons. There are uh, three public universities and three private, but they're all paired. Uh, there's Oxford Cambridge, there's Harvard MIT, and there's Stanford and Berkeley. And I think that uh, both rivalry, but also the capacity to collaborate, uh, because in rivalry is also, of course, uh, connectivity. Uh, uh, a lot can be gained. Uh, 
And as for the, uh, uh, you know, the responsibility of rankings to think about uh, the public, I don't, public as opposed to private universities, I don't think it's a question of putting an asterisk. Uh, uh, but I'm obviously remarking it here uh, because uh, uh, it is something that tends to get lost uh, when you're just looking at excellence, uh, both uh, questions of scale and also questions of what the kinds of uh, constraints might be. Uh, and you know, in the United States, of course, we uh, are particularly focused on US News and World Report. And there it's quite remarkable that in the top 20, we're still number 20, uh, the top public university, but we used to be three or four. Uh, and indeed, there used to be uh, three or four public universities uh, in the top 10 of that ranking. So uh, uh, again, uh, distinct, the definitions of public and private are changing. Uh, the way in which our financial models are going to develop over the future, that will change. Uh, uh, and, uh, and my sense is that private and public universities have to actually work together, and some of these distinctions might get in the way of that. Uh, but in the end, uh, my point here is that uh, we do need to think about uh, the public good. We do need to think about uh, uh, the predicament of, uh, of working with the state where universities are public, not only in the United States, but globally. Uh, and I think we have to uh, be concerned about both excellence and excess uh, and, uh, at the level of scale, as I said in my remarks. But I think one of the things we could do is, as a ranking organization, we could certainly start reporting the kind of data we saw in the New York Times list there. We could look at access, we could look at uh, scholarships, we could look at uh, social inclusion. So we'd be very happy to start adding that context against rankings and, and putting the data into more context. And one of the things we can do now, we've brought that all in-house, is we can actually reward Berkeley for the, for the access mission it has, as well as the excellence mission. Uh, it's lunchtime. That was an absolutely wonderful session. So if we could all thank Professor Nicholas Berkeley. <laughs>